only been the third chair in the company's 80-year-old history. And what do you feel good about your tenure? And, and what do you think were the big learnings from, your, uh, from that role that you played? It was a real privilege to follow my mother as our third chair. And it wasn't just a succession change in, in terms of the chair role, but also a generational transition, mm -hmm. where I was the first chair of the third generation of our family members. And my tenure, which began in 2013 and ended at the end of last year, was one that was characterized by enormous change, change in our portfolio, change in our structure, sales of businesses, purchase, launching businesses. And I think some people from the outside might look at that and say, wow, the third generation just came and thought they should shake everything up and make their mark. And that really wasn't the case. What happened in our, you know, we were nearing our 80th anniversary. We had a combination of internal and external forces that led to that change. Internally, we had three large global platforms, TGI Friday's restaurants, Carlson Begonly Travel, and Carlson Hotels, each of which had grown from very small footprints to large global footprints. And as a privately held company, we weren't in a position to grow each of those businesses to their next phase. In addition, we looked closely at the businesses and we needed to look for the businesses that were going to grow and sustain as we pointed to our 100th anniversary into successive generations of the Carlson family to have businesses that we felt would grow and compete. So we looked at that internally and then externally, as many of the businesses represented in this room have Seen, the external market, the pace of change has rapidly um, accelerated. We faced consolidation of many companies in our industries, mm -hmm. the impact of technolo technology, digital investment. The coinciding of those two things really is what catalyzed us to look at change. Mm -hmm. And I remember facing an early strategy retreat and reading uh, someone who characterized the work of the board as one that involved managing the present, mm -hmm. selectively forgetting the past, mm -hmm. and creating the future. future right. And I loved that roadmap mm -hmm. because we needed to live in the present to mm -hmm. assess what we had, what would grow, what the right. challenges were. And I think for a private family company, mm -hmm. selectively forgetting the past was the most difficult part. Right. Because it's very easy mm -hmm. to feel that you need to preserve everything and that you want to have all those businesses that your grandfather or mother or uncle grew. Mm -hmm. And you should keep them and remain locked in place. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we had to forget some of our identity as we're hoteliers or we're in the restaurant business and really look for the through line that was what part of the past we needed to right. have to fuel our future. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that past was really that we carried through was values. Mm -hmm. Values around being in operating businesses, values around job creation, the value of being part of the Minnesota business community and the Minnesota civic and philanthropic community. Those were through lines that we couldn't forget and didn't want to. Right. And then creating the future. And to create the future, we first had an affirmation amongst our shareholders, our family shareholders, mm -hmm. that we wanted to remain collectively invested. Mm -hmm. We preferred to remain an operating platform. Mm -hmm. And then we had to do the work to create that future. That's amazing. I mean, that, uh, the, this lesson that it's the values that you know, carried you through, and that's the bit that you don't want to forget. I mean, that resonates so well with you know, what we try to communicate to our students as well, that you know, businesses may come and go, but the values you know, have to stay strong. And that is, uh, that's truly, truly remarkable. I, you know, I think that brings me to an, you know, uh, an interesting uh, segue, which is 
you know, you talked about the family business and how hard it is to let go of the past, particularly in that kind of a situation, but also as a private company com compared to a public firm. Yeah. Are there things that you do differently or you feel are different because you're a privately held organization versus a public uh, company? Well, certainly, I think one thing that we've talked about throughout our history and one of the reasons that we continually reaffirmed our desire to remain private is the ability to have that long-term perspective, to say we're in business, hopefully for generations. I think it's an interesting moment in the continuum of the long-term perspective and the short-termism of the market. And we've all seen many more companies, CEOs, policymakers questioning the impact of market forces and short-term mentality. And there's been a, a, a real backlash to some of the problems that have been created by that market cycle and the quarterly earnings reports. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I would say holding too long-term a perspective mm -hmm. could sometimes mask accountability, performance right. metrics, so that finding that sweet spot, and that's something that we really worked for in our business with having the long-term perspective, but also setting up accountability and milestones to make sure that we were tracking where we hoped we were heading for the long term. I love another family with a, many more generations than ours is the Wallenberg family in Sweden who you know, have such an amazing footprint in the number of businesses that, in that country and globally that they have been part of. And Marcus Wallenberg, defined a successful long-term as a series of successful short-terms. And I think that really encapsulates that learning. Right. I would also say two other things that I really felt in leadership as chair for the family. Mm -hmm. One was a concept of alignment. Okay. And I think I learned a lot more about what alignment really means. It's an easy word to say, but when you need to make really big decisions mm -hmm. that call in question your values, your vision for the future, figuring out how to align your management team, your strong leaders, your board, and in our case, a whole nother level of close family shareholders, all of whom you know, right. and all of whom are invested in this as part of the family legacy in addition to business. It takes, one, great data and great analytics and the kind of tools that the students here are learning. If you, you can't make good decisions, align people around decisions if they don't somehow come to believe the same set of facts. And so as we made decisions, we really looked at the data. We looked at communication, being really clear that everyone had the chance to have their voice, to make decisions together. Of course, there's a tension you can't be in, uh, you know, making decision mode and hearing everyone's voice forever. But it was very important to gain that alignment. And I truly believe that spending the time on alignment is what creates momentum when you move forward. And it keeps people on board. So alignment was a great lesson I learned and continue to practice. I mean, that's, that's also fascinating to me because there's also another aspect of alignment, right, which is alignment with your employees. I mean, you have the family, you have the board, you have the folks around you, but there are a lot of others. You know, at some point you were employing tens and tens and thousands of employees at all levels. Yes. And I know one of the things that, you know, that has really distinguished your family is your commitment to the community, the philanthropy that has, you know, generated so much. I mean, it's done so much for the university, for, you know, arts organizations around this city, obviously arts organizations in, you know, in uh, other parts of the country and around the world as well. So, I mean, just this, you know, this commitment to philanthropy, how do you sort of um, get your employees on board with that? How do you sort of uh, make sure that these values are communicated not just within the family, but also to your, you know, to, to the employees who are the sort of the, who uh, are the 
the rock that supports the organization. I'm right. so glad that you asked about that and focused on the employees right. because it can be easy to look at philanthropy and our footprint mm -hmm. with the family name, right. but the employees have been such an enormous part of the impact that we've been able to have right. philanthropically. And we have a Carlson Family Foundation led by my sister Wendy as the chair and our incredible executive director, David Nelson. And they work in concert with the company and Carlson on philanthropy. And I'll give you an example of the way that this works. Um, combating human trafficking has been a long effort of our family and our company. And it began when my mother, 20 years ago, helped sign the ECPAT code to protect children around the world, bringing both our family and company into a journey in a really difficult space. While our family made contributions with the World Childhood Foundation and through the family side of the foundation in efforts like Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale that mm -hmm. the Women's Foundation led, our company with a global footprint being in travel and hotels was able to look at the issue globally mm -hmm. and our employees as hard as this issue was to face, our employees were fully on board and leading. They led us into new ways that we could have impact. Right. When we had the hotel company, our employees devised a training program that was shared with all our competitors on how to recognize signs of trafficking and look for them in hotels. And recently, in an effort that I'm really proud of, and we were joined by many other Minnesota companies, mm -hmm. Our, we supported an organization called THORN, which is protecting children with technology tools with the proliferation of social media and the web. Mm -hmm. There have been more incidents of child trafficking and child abuse digitally. Mm -hmm. And our chief technology officer for Carlson Begonley Travel organized a hackathon which brought together other Minnesota companies, Target, Best mm -hmm. Buy, joining us to put technologists to work to try and develop tools to help combat this trafficking. So we've had countless examples of employees taking the lead, finding ways to help the philanthropic footprint. And the other thing I'll say is, going back to values, mm -hmm. many, many millennials talk very um, openly about the desire to align their personal values right. with their workplace. Sure. I believe that's not only a millennial trait, we see it in every generation that works with our company, but it's been a part of the way that we've retained our incredible Carlson colleagues is allowing them to express the values philanthropically. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's also been part of the way we've engaged our own next generation of Carlson mm -hmm. family members. They are really proud of the philanthropic footprint. Right, and a way to keep the next generation of millennials sort of engaged, I and mean, that's, that's wonderful too. It's, um, you know, I, I, I'd love to sort of get a sense also from you of your personal journey through all this. Mm. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it couldn't have been easy just sort of being thrown into some of these leadership roles, and you've led both, you know, nonprofit organizations as well as, you know, the, the Carlson Companies itself as, a, as chair, and so, you know, what helped you do that? What, you know, what are some of the lessons you may have learned from that? How do you sort of stay true to yourself as you go through this uh, process? Well, I feel very grateful to have been part of the journey of some wonderful institutions. Mm -hmm. I will say that being chair of Carlson provided me with more sleepless nights than any other, uh, any other leadership Chip role because Many other things you do your best and then you might have your term end mm -hmm. and you don't have your children, your sister's children, your cousin's children looking at you and saying, why did you do that? What happened there? And so there's an extra, an extra joy and an extra challenge. And for me, I think the key to each role goes back to the conversation we had on values. And 
in some ways, the vision of a leader can be a very external vision. You're raising the flag and charging the ramparts. And I think that the first journey for leadership has to be one that goes within, to have real clarity on values and priorities. There are some very interesting um, thinkers on these topics that have inspired me. Some here at the Carlson School. Harry Kramer wrote a book on values-based leadership that was really helpful to me in the idea of aligning one's, every part of one's life from allocation of time to values. And recently, Hubert Jolie shared a book, uh, Aligned, by Hortense Le Gentil. And the premise of her book is that when we align our personal values with professional uh, tasks, that that can really fuel productivity. So the touchstone that we've had with our family values and our corporate values mm -hmm. and the journey that I did to bring my own values really has been my true north. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the biggest value has been the idea of doing work to benefit others. Mm -hmm. And John Hennessy, the former president of Stanford, mm -hmm. defined legacy in a way I loved. And he said, mm -hmm. um, legacy means ensuring your work has benefited others. And that's, that's my true that's, north. That's the best legacy of all. That's amazing. That's great. Well, I think with that, let's open it up to questions. I'm sure the audience would have questions out there. I know we have a couple of mics around. So the, so. Sorry, Sheree. There are three of us that are walking around with microphones. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll come to you. Hi, I'll be very brief on this one, but my name is Mark Hughes. And there's somebody special here today that helped me get started at Business Day School or Carlson School way back when. That's Marilyn Nelson Carlson. And I'd like to publicly thank her because when I met with her long, long ago, the first time, she said, I'll get you in here, but you got to do the work. Yeah. So Marilyn, thanks for whatever I've done in this business world today. Uh, you're a big part of it, and I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Hi, this is also a, a more, more of a statement like the previous person, but uh, Diana, I wanted to thank you. My name is Carl. Um, a couple years ago here, I, I won a scholarship that uh, the, the Carlson family underwrote. Um, I have three children. It, it took a lot of the burden off of them while still allowing me to be able to get the degree I needed to take uh, care of them. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. Hello, and thank you. Uh, I have a question. Since Carlson has such a strong family presence in it, what type of processes have you guys implemented to keep bias out of your strategic decision making and keep that diversity of perspective so that you guys can be more successful in your both short-term and long-term planning? That, that is a great plan, a great question. Uh, one of the keys, I think, for us is that our board, from its inception, has been a board that included both independents and family members. And my grandfather put that governance construct in place when he was still the sole owner of Carlson but anticipating generations where there would be multiple owners. And it's key that we bring board members with outstanding business expertise, and we've been incredibly fortunate to have phenomenal uh, Minnesota leaders and leaders from around the country and even internationally on our board to bring that perspective. But it's also really key that the family allow them to have that perspective and really make clear that they are there to be candid, to be sometimes more than candid, brutally honest, and we have been well partnered by that. So that's really a key.
Hi, thank you for being here today and for your great conversation. It's very clear that the Carlson companies are very uh, values driven and the story that you told about uh, Marilyn and making the uh, human trafficking choice, I got to hear at uh, Women's Leader Cast earlier uh, last year, so so good to hear that. But I was really interested in what you, Diana, had to say about how you were living your values in some of your restructuring plans um, and how you were streamlining your businesses according to that, those values. And I'd just love to hear a little bit more about which specific values you may have latched on to that may have helped you streamline your businesses. Sure. Well, First of all, in business, um, a value to sustaining a business is to have businesses that perform and compete. It's really, really important. And it's that, so we did look for businesses that we felt would be competitive, would grow, would create opportunity, not just for the shareholders, but for the careers and lives of people working in those businesses. We also um, had, an incredible opportunity as we sold some businesses and created that future to launch a new business. And that's Carlson Private Capital Partners. And Carlson Private Capital took us back to our roots of entrepreneurship, of helping nurture businesses early in their footprint. When my grandfather bought TJI Fridays, there were 12 and it grew to over 1,000 globally. There was one Radisson Hotel in downtown Minneapolis and that became 1,400 globally. So the idea of empowering entrepreneurs and growing businesses was a value that the family got really excited about, touching back to that and bringing it to life. And we were very, very fortunate um, to have an incredible team with Andy Cantwell being our new CEO for that business. Andy was um, mentored by a great University of Minnesota leader, John Lindahl, who represented and brought that duality of business competitiveness and a touchstone to real values. So that was certainly another value that we held close. And finally, the most fundamental value was family unity and that we needed to be able to take hard decisions, to sell things, to launch things, but with the overarching value that nothing would be worse than losing family unity as we move through that process. Thank you. Are there any more we have questions? time for one more. Yeah, Allison, you yes. Hi, Diane. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's Vinicius Silva with uh, Accenture. Truly inspired by what you said, what's the job of the board? And I, I love the uh, selectively forgetting about the past. Would you share, be able to share what is one thing you selective uh, forgot uh, yeah. through your journey? Well, I've forgotten. <laughs> um, I I really, I think that um, there are two elements. One, the hardest was, um, the hardest was really forgetting, uh, forgetting about being connected to a business that you love. And the hotel business was one, it was a consumer facing business. We stayed in the hotels. We had family events in the downtown Radisson over and over. And we had to forget that um, we weren't going to be able to sustain for the future if we focused too much on the relationships and businesses of the present moment. And one way to help us forget was to look back to our own history which began as gold bond stamp company. There are no gold bond stamps <laughs> in our present. And that emboldened us to allow us to let go of some things that we loved but needed to forget as part of our future. Thank you so much, Diana. It's so clear that you know, the Carlson's companies, they, you know, it's been such a, a beacon of constancy while evolving and changing. And I think that's a, 
just a wonderful example for all of us business people in, uh, around here and a wonderful lesson also for our students. So thank you for doing this. That, it's been sort of long overdue and I'm so delighted that we finally managed to get you out, out thank here you, speaking Shri. about these companies and, and thank, thank you, you for everything that you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Really.